Great. I want to welcome everyone here this evening to the uh, Wednesday, May 10th meeting of the CSUC Board of Directors. I want to call the meeting to order. And the very first agenda item is uh, the Native Lands Acknowledgement. And its purpose, it really is to acknowledge someone is to say that I see you and you are significant. The purpose of a land acknowledgement is to recognize and pay respect to the original inhabitants of a specific region. And it's an opportunity to express gratitude and appreciation to the territory you exist in. So the COCC land acknowledgement is that COCC would like to acknowledge that the beautiful land our campuses reside on are the original homelands of the Watsku, the Watsko, and the Wanalama, or the Warm Spring people. They ceded this land to the U.S. government in the Treaty of 1855. The Numu, the Paiute people, were forcibly moved to the Warm Springs Indian Reservation starting in 1879. It's also important to note that the Klamath Trail ran north through this region to the Great Celilo Falls trading grounds, and the Klamath tribes claim it as their own. Descendants of these original people are thriving members of our communities today. We acknowledge and thank the original stewards of the sun. Next item is the roll call. Yeah. Um, Bruce Evernesson. Here. Joe Krenowitz. Yes. Laura Craft-Richardson. Here. Alan Unger. Here. Erica Scaffold. Here. Jim Clinton. Here. Oliver Tatum. Here. Ari Chesley. Here. Henry Hamlin. Here. Uh, Alicia Moore. Here. Laura Bomey. Here. Zach Boone. Here. Dustin Saylor. Here. Rebecca Lambert. Here. Richard Hurd. Here. Uh, Debbie Hart. Here. Roger Detweiler. Here. Harry Hamilton. Julie Downing. Here. Jeremy Green. Here. Susie Christensen. Here. Paul Taylor. Here. Kathleen Knudsen. Here. Kyle Matthews. Here. And Jenny Hobbit. That is the role. Great. Are there any agenda changes that I need to know about, Lori? No. Okay. Is there any public comments? Is there anyone that would like to present to the board this evening? Jen, anyone online? No. Okay. At this point, we're going to adjourn to the budget committee and turn things over to Roger. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for the sandwiches. Uh, thanks to everyone attending, discussing the non board members. Um, I guess we got four of us here. You can see it. Uh, and uh, we have you online. Uh, at any rate, thanks to you all for helping us along. That's, um, and thanks for the hard copies. And, and then we can have the public that we can deal with you. So, Roger, can you speak up just a sure. little bit, please? Okay. Um, I'm just saying, yeah. thank you. I appreciate the hard copy documents, which is easier to work with us and also text savvy to use. Um, and I wanted to uh, mention to say that I've chosen the vice chair. Uh, I don't know whether you have to watch her. Roger, my recommendation is I think perhaps better wording would be you had a chance to talk to Rebecca and you. And there's that. I, I know, but I think she does need to be voted in by the full okay. committee. So I guess what, maybe you'd like to make a motion that to have Rebecca Lambert be the vice chair of the budget committee. Can I make a comment first? Yeah. So um, under ORS 294-414, that's where we um, are required and enabled to have a budget committee. And I just consulted with our legal counsel. Um, it, it does say that um, at our first meeting, we're supposed to elect a presiding officer from among the members. It does not say provide for any other officers. However, um, I don't see anything that prohibits it. So I, I, I think it's not a bad idea. If Roger were not here, then we have someone to to um, serve. But I do think the reason I bring all of this up is to say, I think it would be a good idea if when we make a motion to appoint a vice chair, since it's not statutorily um, designated, we should specify that that person is here to serve um, if the chair is not available or something like something to that effect. Well, the reason I did that is because I served in several times. I 
serve as vice chair of the public. So there must be some, I assume, some authority. There, or, there or, are or different. They don't, have a, they don't have a lawyer on the board. <laughs> I, I will say there are different yeah, statutory provisions for different. For, there are a number of different statutory provisions. Some do. The one that authorizes for, for community colleges does not. I, I wanted to, to nominate uh, because the book has taken time to meet uh, with Kathleen and try to get a better handle on this. And so uh, I asked her to serve. So well, I, I will I will make a motion to that effect that Rebecca Lambert serve as the vice chair of the budget committee uh, with the understanding that her role is to assume the role of the chair if you were not here. Uh, a second. Move and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for being willing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, uh, I did spend some time this morning trying to sort out all the documents. And uh, included, we have a have the original set of documents, the motion that we have to approve. You see now that that's been amended, we have a new motion to be amended. So that's what we're laughing at this evening after we have some discussion. Um, they, um, I guess I too much um, required to ask for public comment. Um, I just suppose it's my agenda. You know, if there's any, anybody who has anything to say, go to hold the peace. I have nothing to keep on my Okay. Okay. Hearing none, I think mm -hmm. we move on. Um, to approve of the minutes, I will support it. I make a motion to approve the April 12th budget committee minutes. Second. Okay. Okay. The second and approve the minutes of the last meeting. All in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> so moving on now to uh, the proposed non-general fund budget. Um, Kathleen. Uh, You'll find that on pages one to 32 of the division. There, there are a few pages that don't have numbers. Uh, and the only reason I, only problem I feel is that if I drop the whole thing on the floor, <laughs> I might have a problem putting it back. Otherwise, they're fine. Uh, so, Kathleen, if you proceed, thank you. All right. Um, sitting at the table so the folks um, online can hear via the microphone a little bit better. Um, and just to note, the documents that were sent out this afternoon include an updated debt schedule, the interest payment, I noticed there was an error there, um, and then the resolution <clears throat> had, it had a couple updated numbers, and then we also sent out a hard or a soft copy, I provided hard copies of the top of the Um, so we'll start, um, first of all, welcome, uh, we're going to start with a general fund overview from Lori. Um, I will then go into the proposed non-general budget fund. Um, and then finally, at the end, we'll seek approval for uh, the government. I hope I'm going to say that can I ask that you speak to the end of the All right, Tess, can the folks online hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, I'm actually gonna um, talk back to Lori to start with our general fund review. Make sure the clicker works. <laughs> um, you know, first, if I may, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to uh, Roger, a chairperson Detweiler, um, who uh, had a nice visit with both me and Kathleen, I think last week, and we had some conversation about how we could, um, from our part as, as college staff, make this a more uh, meaningful and engaging process for the budget committee members who we don't see very often, you see typically twice a year. 
and um, Roger made some very good suggestions, uh, one of which was that we sort of make sure that when I make remarks, we tie them to numbers later in a presentation and that we do some summary and, and other things. And the other, um, the other thing that I uh, committed for the coming year is that um, our soon to arrive Vice President of Finance and Operations would meet individually with each one of you um, and put together a really short, if you're willing, orientation to budget at college. Um, so I really appreciate your making us aware and making suggestions. I want to add to Rebecca mentioned she had a little something to say about this too. I don't know if this is appropriate time, but I want to. Lori, thank you. That's <clears throat> just what I would have requested. Um, I, I had a great orientation with Kathleen, but that was around the um, general fund. And um, of course, as you all know, you need to hear it and see it and live with it multiple times for anything to actually sink in. Um, so as you can well imagine, when I open this morning, before getting the PowerPoint, um, I was lost. And that doesn't, I, I can be very constructive. So great suggestion, look forward to having a little bit more to work with when I open envelopes next year. Um, thank you for, for saying that. Um, so a little bit of a summary from last time. We talked about what were the guiding principles we used for the general fund and um, probably for budgeting as a whole, not just for the general fund. Uh, the first was to maintain a conservative approach to budget development and the fund approach to spending. And so I talked a lot about choices, uh, making choices this year. And I think that this year we've had to make more and more significant choices about what we want to do. And um, we have challenged the leadership team and they have risen to the challenge to um, find money in their budgets rather than asking uh, for more um, to work with each other um, as they do very, very well to reallocate funds uh, across units. And they do a great job at that. And so, and they put up with me in this meeting. So um, I really kudos to the leadership team for their ability to really think very broadly about budget and to Kathleen for challenging us as well. So I wanted to share with you some of the things that we decided to fund. We made a, a really thoughtful choice about what we would do. One is, thanks to Laura Bomey's uh, great uh, persuasion, you're hiring an, another IT security specialist um, for the coming year because that's become such a um, critical area for the college. Um, and, uh, another area that's very critical for the college for us to maintain our accessibility and for us to keep current with all the trends in online and hybrid learning is um, we hired an, uh, an accessibility specialist um, for our uh, e-learning center. So very uh, future focused kinds of choices. There were a few things, there were a number of things we chose not to, and this is not neither list of what we did and what we did in the disaster, um, but there were some things we chose not to do. Laura didn't get an IT uh, analyst, that functional analyst, another one that she was hoping for. Um, we didn't provide some additional funding to market and public relations. I'm looking at everybody who didn't get what they wanted. Uh, uh, Redmond wanted an ATV plow. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. You know, and and I think what I want to I, I want to use this to be a lux for good because not a single request that came forward was frivolous at all, uh, and we had to um, you know make some tough decisions. Providing accessibility and affordability, as you will recall from the last meeting, we uh, are raising tuition across our different categories of student in district, out of district, et cetera, between 4% and 5%. And tuition for our in-district students, who are by far and away the largest population, um, that equates to $5 per credit. We maintain, we continue to make investments in our e-learning, um, which is another tool for accessibility. 
in our branch campuses where we still need, we need to do more, but um, these principles are very important to us as we move forward as well. Continuing to use grant funds strategically, as Kathleen can share in detail, we were incredibly fortunate over the past several years to benefit from HERP dollars, higher education emergency relief funds, which are what um, colleges and universities across the country got to meet the, meet the demands of COVID and to not only make up for some lost revenue, but to buy the equipment and buy the safety um, apparatus that we really needed. Um, that goes away next year. Uh, and so, um, you know, we made sure we use those dollars. We use them wisely, not frivolously. I'd rather give back money than use it in a, in a frivolous way. But we were incredibly strategic about that. Um, and you'll see a little later in this meeting, Alicia Moore is leading our next Title III grant <coughs> request. So the major federal grant uh, to strengthen institutions. We received our first one six years ago? 2016. Seven years ago. Um, and now we're, we're eligible to try for another, and that will help us fund for the future some things we really think are important that she will tell you about a little bit later. Making needed investments, um, as I spoke about, uh, we needed and will continue to need to make investments in employee wages so that we can continue to be competitive, but not excessive. Uh, with our classified employees this past year, on average, we raised wages 11%. Not everybody 11 on average. Uh, facilities, um, we have some significant uh, deferred maintenance needs. We are allocating in next year's budget $2.4 million more than we have previously. Uh, mostly to uh, resolve some HVAC issues, some electrical issues, and a roof. Um, and then significant investments in technology, roughly half a million dollars that we put toward uh, li uh, computer life cycle, life cycle replacement. Um, and and uh, kudos to Anne-Marie and to Laura for really looking at analyzing the data. What computers aren't we using? Well, then we don't need those. We're not going to replace things just because we used to have them. So we've said no to some. Um, and some critical infrastructure servers and the like. So that's a short recap. Um, uh, Kathleen is going to give you an even better sense of some of those investments. And uh, Kathleen, please go ahead. All right. Jen, I need you to do the manual. Again. Um, <clears throat> So move for our non-general funds. Uh, the college has nine non-general fund types. Each fund has a specific purpose as defined by local budget law and governmental accounting standards. The primary budget objective is to ensure adequate appropriation authority and compliance to the fund's specific legal restrictions and designated purpose. Each fund is to be self-balancing, meaning expenditures cannot exceed the resources. <clears throat> So these are our main fund types. We spoke about the general fund already. Um, I will go into a little more detail for the non-general funds. Um, I'll describe each fund type. Then I will display a summary of resources and requirements. I'll try to highlight any notable changes in the proposed budget. Um, there's lots of detail that was sent out in the packet. Um, so feel free to ask any questions regarding the non-general funds. Hey, Jen. All right, I'm trying to get you a wider board in now. So oh, anything. <laughs> How are you? So we're going to start with the, the debt service fund. And as I noted, um, a couple updates to the schedules that were sent out. Um, and then the summary, in the summary, and I'll highlight those numbers. Um, so this accounts for our long-term debt. Uh, we have three outstanding bonds. Our full faith and credit obligation, um, is related to our residence hall and is used to finance the building of the residence hall. Our pension bonds um, provide additional purchase funding and our general obligation bonds uh, finance the building of the Middleton Science Center, 
the Health Careers Building, and construction in Redmond, Madras, and Pineville. And I listed the um, expiration dates of each of these lines. Uh, the college is in full compliance with all of our debt restrictions, limitations, and disclosures, and our current rating is double A. Kathleen, I got a quick question. Yep. So the pension bonds, yep. uh, I'm guessing I was on the board when we <laughs> decided yeah. to, I don't know if that's going yes. But I'm curious, are we going to, are we on track to have that be sufficient or are we likely to have to put more money into the, into the pot to cover? I'm, I'm hoping that's sufficient. Okay. Yeah. The way it currently works is it's included in our payroll assessment. So I know at the last meeting we talked about, you know, how much longer will our payroll investments continue to increase? At least based on current outstanding debt, they will decrease by about 8%. Our payroll investments will decrease by about 8% in 2028. Okay, thank you. Um, and so this <laughs> schedule here is our summary of resources and requirements for our outstanding debt. The interest payments under the requirements, that was the figure that was updated in the schedules that were sent out. Um, <clears throat> it's worth noting the, ta the current tax revenue line and the resources, that agrees to the amount included in the resolution. Yeah. Um, do I take that to mean that, I don't know how to ask this question. I see a tax revenue current, there's something every year on that one. Mm -hmm. So does the resolution look like last year's resolution with a different number for that addition? Is that yep. kind of typical? Yeah, um, and that's provided to the different counties um, to collect that tax revenue. Um, we don't receive an exact amount, the 3.093. We don't receive that in you know precise amount annually. So there's usually kind of a catch up. So the prior tax revenue essentially is you know, past year's tax revenue is being paid late. Okay. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, moving on to our capital projects fund. Um, <clears throat> capital projects fund accounts for major capital outlays for new buildings, remodels, plan improvements, and equipment. Um, I've listed uh, different activities. I wanted to note the bookstore listed there would be for any potential remodel. It's not for our current bookstore operations. And then also highlighting the Magic Center is a new um, capital fund this year. Um, and then related to Madras, we've increased our expected income related to our capital projects fund by about 10 million as well as our outlay, our capital outlay and materials and services. Kathleen, is that 10 million already identified and funded or? For Madras? Um, that would be a question for Jeremy and no, that. No, that's, that's expected federal and state appropriations that we've asked for. Um, that would be all of those conditions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and we obviously wouldn't spend unless we receive that right. money. Right. All right, moving on. Uh, and then here's a sample of current and upcoming projects. Lori listed a couple of them, um, and estimated expenditures for those projects is 2.4 million. I know in past year or last year, we um, mentioned the fact that there had been kind of reduced uh, repair and maintenance spending in past years. So we're kind of catching up, you know, last year's budget and this year's budget, and probably the next couple years' budget as we address. Some, um, some general repairs across our campuses. Can I ask, is this is this like a typical year or I mean, are we likely to have a roof next time? Or I'm just sort of curious when you when you move out, um, you know, where where is the boa constrictors, you know, digestion of stuff that's going, that's going through? Yeah, Alicia might want to speak to that a little in a little more detail than me. Yeah, you know, part of what we've been doing is developing a longer range plan in the <laughs> facilities for the next couple of years. For us, and we haven't really hit that point of saying, and here's where we get the thought of spending at this level. We do have some significant uh, roof issues, uh, HVAC system issues in buildings that are everything from six years old to eight years old. So we, my best guess at this point um, is we've got probably two or three more years, maybe not quite at this level. But after that, we should start being able to shift more from 
emergency repair, big maintenance replacements, more routine maintenance. Thank you. And I, I mean, Lori already mentioned this, but with our new vice president of finance and operations, there may be a facilities assessment on his list. Um, he's, he has been in San Francisco celebrating his anniversary. Um, and he starts up next Monday. So we're very excited and absolutely uh, new facilities master plan is one of his priorities. All right, moving on to our enterprise fund. These, these provide services to students, employees, and the general public on a user fee or sales basis. This includes our residence hall, food service, and our bookstore. Probably the notable page here would be the capital outlay number, um, as I believe there's some food service equipment that will be replaced. Otherwise, it's fairly routine, but All right. <clears throat> Uh, our internal service fund is a fairly small fund uh, it includes our copy machine contract. So that's all of our copiers on campus and the revenues collected via interfund um, uh, charges. Our copy center, which is located in our bookstore will be closing this year. There's not enough um, activity of printing first packs and charging departments. So anything that needs to be printed, paper copy and bound, will uh, outsource that instead of employing somebody in the copy center. All right. And then the significant uh, change from last year to this year would just be the transfer out number. Our plan is to um, transfer the fund balance of the copy center uh, to the general fund. Our reserve fund. <laughs> this is another small fund with pretty minimal activity. It was established, established by the college to meet obligations associated with retiree benefits and uh, any for its initial first liability. Uh, so there's still a fairly significant fund balance there. Um, <clears throat> so we budget uh, $430,000 transfer out into the general fund to help balance the general fund budget. Uh, it's probably worth noting that amount which we budgeted for the past couple of years. If the general fund doesn't need it, we reverse that transfer um, to maintain a, a significant fund balance in the reserve fund. How is, how is the debt service fund, I'm sorry, how is the reserve fund different or related to the pension bonds element and the debt service fund? Uh, they're they're uh, totally separate. So this would be any liabilities that we have for our retirees or um, additional money that we may need to pay to PERS. The PERS debt service would, is it as a bond. So um, we're paying a principal and interest related, related to our pension. I guess my question how come how come that bond wasn't bigger so we wouldn't need this element of or I, I guess yeah I mean I don't, I don't feel strongly about or that smaller answer. because we have this amount of yeah. reserve. Yeah. yeah I don't know. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, our special revenue funds represent our grant funds. Uh, spending is restricted to the purposes defined within the grant or the contract. Um, Worth noting that several several of our grants allow us to provide additional services to students and new programs. Um, I'll identify some of our different grants. Or sorry, um, I, I guess it's worth noting on this one. Um, our Lori mentioned our first grant, our transfer out of two point five million dollars in the current year budget that will be going away. Um, we use that to balance for the general fund and provide other. Uh, transfers to some of our non-general funds. All right. <clears throat> our auxiliary fund includes a variety of supplementary activities within the college. Um, different types are self-sustaining would be things like our club sports or our vending activity. Non-general fund instruction uh, includes many non-credit programs uh, such as community education and adult based basic skills. Um, our revolving activities include the foundation um, support and contractual and administrative provisions. Those would be our employee group professional development funds. Um, so worth noting on the summary of, of this fund, uh, we are planning to move our summer term to the general funds. I noted that last month. So you'll see the tuition and fees decreases significantly from this year to next year. 
um, and our transfer out is significantly larger. We anticipate about a $1.3 million fund balance at the end of this year in our summer term that will transfer to the general fund. Kathleen had a question yeah. in the detail. Yeah. In the big picture, the thing is a very, very small number. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious. <laughs> um, the, the differences between the Redmond campus operations trying to go in that mm -hmm. swing from 310,000 down to 2,000. And so I was just curious about that. Um, and, and that's the um, under the auxiliary fund um, yeah. campus yeah, operations. I and I, I think that um, in Redmond, is there a significant transfer out of like 250,000? So you'll see yeah. the column. So, so we are um, using that. I think to support capital projects. Yeah. yeah. So the, the primary different items are so different. In Redmond, um, all of building two is in each out. So we get substantial revenue for that building. Okay. And then that money is used not only for general activities of college, but uh, Redmond campus specific capital projects needs and other operations. So it, it functions very differently. Um, whereas a Kirk County, for example, does three shot space, um, average is about a small space, so it's in half, so a very specific Okay, thanks. All right, move on to my next slide. Um, so these are used to disperse uh, funds to students based on rules and regulations from the grantor. Um, federal grant financial aid would be Pell Grants, College Work Study, uh, state grants would be things like Oregon Promise. Our institutional financial aid would be um, foundation scholarships, foundation awards, um, and other financial aid would be things like the Native American program scholarships and some of our veteran programs. Um, let's click to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> so no real significant changes here. Um, it's difficult to illustrate um, the awards, the HARP awards to our students looking at two years of actuals and then our budget. Um, but we did see a, a big increase in <clears throat> fiscal 22 with student awards for um, that that was via per funds. All right. <clears throat> and then our trust and agency fund is a fairly small fund. We have a small endowment that is used, the proceeds are used for scholarships. And then the Oregon Community College Library Association is an agency fund used for uh, coordinating activities with the library. Where's the Kai's Kai's fund? Is that in this or yep. why is it an auxiliary and not custom agency? Um because we don't hold the the endow the endowment of it. Um we receive proceeds from it, so we award the proceeds and then um then do that fund. It's held with another foundation. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, any questions on any of the specific funds before we get to the bigger picture? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, no, no, that's great. Questions. That's great. That's great. <laughs> question. um, under grants, which is actually a page I understood, so I was really kind of happy about that. Um, I was just curious uh, the largest, if I read it right, the largest grant and the largest, largest contract is connected to Deer Ridge. Okay. And so I was just wondering, and don't know if anyone would be. Who's here um, about the sustainability about that? I'm always thinking about that when I'm looking at grants. Oh, yeah. Um, so, is that something that we would imagine seeing in the future, or is that is that funding is pretty solid and steady? And That's a big question. We actually have a couple experts in the audience, so <laughs> that may may be able to talk about our year ridge program. Mm -hmm. yeah, the question was, um, sorry, it's the largest grant and the largest contract in the budget, so that's why I noted it. Is that Pretty reliable funding. Do we think that will continue? We do actually. And our current grant goes to um, June and June this year. Uh -huh. And that's been about a six month grant. And we're expecting then a two year grant to follow up on that. Okay. Hey, Marie, is it, is it accurate? I, I'm sort of speculating here. Is it accurate, even though it's technically a grant, we almost view it more as a contract? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah. not necessarily competitive. <laughs> Kind of against ourselves and the uh, requirements of the, okay. the application. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we put that together. Still have to do the work of applying exactly. and managing yeah, it. Right. Managing it is a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. Like I looked it up for them, like a neat program. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And then uh, Debbie pointed out related to our grant funds, the new program line, yes. that's essentially for you know grants that we don't know that we're going to get or not. 
So we seek additional appropriation in anticipation of receiving new grants in the next fiscal year. Yep. All right. <laughs> Uh, so this is just a comparison by fund type year over year. Um, I won't go through every line, but worth noting, so our general fund, Corey spoke to this already a, a little bit, um, $3.3 .3 million increase from prior year, uh, primarily related to salary increases. Um, our, our salaries and payroll assessments is our biggest expenditure, and um, we go up every year. <laughs> Uh, and then we also increased our contingency line from $800,000 to $1 million this year or for next year. Um, our capital projects fund went up significantly as we planned for the Madras expansion. Again, we won't spend the money unless the, the dollars are awarded or if the dollars are there. Um, our special revenue fund is going down by $3 million, specifically related to the expiration of our HERP funds. Um, and our auxiliary fund, the transfer out of the summer term was around uh, 1.3 million. So that's why we increased the transfer out for next year. That's a helpful slide. Oh, yes, great. thank you. Yeah. And then the next slide is just a visual comparison. Um, blue is the proposed budget for next year and red is the current year adopted budget. All right, next. <laughs> Um, so this slide is a summary of our transfers, transfers out of the general fund. Um, so um, each area within our general fund, essentially, you know, there are some some things that were contracted to do other areas that need funding for the next year. Um, so they're identified in the general fund you know, where we need to support our non-general funds. Um, instruction, we have a fairly large transfer out related to adult basic skills and community education. Um, in instructional support, um, we transfer money to our sabbatical fund uh, and some professional improvement funds. Um, our student services transfer is fairly small. Um, our college support services area, that supports um, some, some capital uh, purchases. Um, Foundation support staff and our strategic, our strategic plan, um, infrastructure or campus services area within the general fund supports some capital equipment and repair areas, and IT um, we transfer out to some life cycle areas and IT infrastructure. Um, so that's what we transfer out of the general fund into some non-general fund. The next slide uh, illustrates transfers into the general fund or yeah, non-general transfers out. <laughs> so there are some that transfer, some non-general funds that transfer to the general fund, others that transfer to other non-general funds. Um, our reserve fund, I mentioned that $430,000 is to support the general fund. Our enterprise fund, um, you'll see the $1.16 million transfer to the debt service. So um, we take money from our residence hall operations and, and pay our debt for the residence hall. Um, there's also some transfers from the bookstore and food service that help support our general fund. Um, auxiliary services, we have that $1.3 million from the summer session, um, as well as some, you know, the, the Redmond transfer out that 250000 that we talked about. Um, and then some, some other auxiliary funds are supporting some capital projects to build our general fund. And then financial aid is actually moving just from one financial aid fund to another financial aid. So any questions regarding our transfers? I know it's come in from past years. All right, great. <laughs> so this slide is just a summary. Um, the total in the um, bottom right corner of the 118, 118 million is the amount that's included in the resolution. So any questions on the proposed budget? Uh, so just some of our key takeaways, the proposed budget retains the board uh, required general, general reserve of 10%. We actually estimate it to be closer to 24%. Uh, we managed fiscal years to a balanced or positive financial operating position uh, and make sure that our expenditures are within legal appropriation limits. Our general fund budget includes a million dollar operating contingency if we should need it. Um, 
We're conservative with our revenue and expenditure projections. Our long-term obligations are in full compliance with debt covenants and continuing uh, disclosure requirements. <clears throat> we have adequate spending appropriation for financial aid, grants, contracts, and new programs. Um, and there are additional resources for competitive wages, facility maintenance, repairs, and information technology. All right. Kathleen, I got a quick question. Yeah. And I maybe I missed it at the last meeting. 24% general fund reserve. That's mm -hmm. that seems higher than I ever remember it being. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of curious what were the main factors for having that? Was that a target going in, or is that sort of what what emerged? And I guess my question is, does that give us more buffer or what that seems higher than we've ever had in the past? Yeah, I would say, I mean, it definitely gives us more buffer. Um, the past couple of years, what we budget and what we've actually spent, um, there's been bigger discrepancy there, mostly related to salary savings and payroll assessment savings. We've also received a lot of money from her. Um, I mean, I think in the end, we're probably going to have $5 billion that was um, lost revenue that we can draw, and that helps support our fund balance. Um, so I would say the past few years have been really um, a little good. <laughs> and it's, it's, you know, it's added our, our uh, general fund balance. And it's the idea that, that and the reason, I guess, I'm just mm -hmm. speculating here now. So is it that we're, we're, we need to make sure that we don't have a new baseline from where we are operating higher than we can actually sustain? Um, and, and do you anticipate this going down back to more historical levels, closer to 10, 12, 15%? Or is my question? Yeah. How, 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 I mean, <laughs> I'm guessing there, there, might be some, there might be some items that I didn't quite make the initial cut, but if we have mm -hmm. funding, we might, yeah. this might be a good to do deferred maintenance or something like mm -hmm. that. Yep. Yeah. Is that my own, uh, this is my own bias? and. You can all tell me differently. I think 10% is really admirable. Mm -hmm. It makes me nervous. I mean, I, honestly, my goal would be to have it be a little higher. So my reaction was uh, because there's a, there's, a, there's a degree of I guess, security in that. I mean, obviously, I think it's, I think it's possible, and Kathleen, jump in here, that we'll see this go down a little bit, back down to a slightly lower number. Um, because of just some uh, lack of predictability in the coming years, um, and the need the need to continue to to make some investment, but um, I, yeah, I this gives me a, a sense of security. Uh, and um, do, and, do and you think again, I, I there are folks who have said to me, Lori, do you think you need a reserve? Money? There's a part of me, and, and I'm happy to be outvoted here, but if we're making the case of going out to the public and they look at our reserve fund of 24%, it, that's, that, it makes it more difficult to raise outside funding. And again, I'm, I, I don't know whether, I agree, 10% seems low to me, 24% yeah. seems high to me, and I'm just one person giving my opinion. I, I would mention something, I think, related to that. So we're thinking of this number if we were on, we were thinking about the same thing. And I also think it might be worth a bit of a conversation about a tuition increase with given the last few years have been good and, and we have Patty. Mm -hmm. And I know we talked about this a month ago. And I heard the rationale. I think I'd like to have a summary of that again. Mm -hmm. um, I did I you know I'm gonna <laughs> I've known for even worse casually, so <laughs> I'm going to sort of pick on Kathleen. But it's, I, I wouldn't say we've had good years. I just, I don't, I don't see it that way. Um, if we hadn't had money from what about 21 million from birth dollars, yeah. some of which went to students, we would have had to cut positions significant numbers of significant programs. And so when I look at something like COVID and say, if we hadn't had that, our 10% wouldn't have met much. So um, that, that's the kind of way, the way that I think. And um, I don't think that, I think that maintaining a level of security 
and um, a, a safety net um, is is a is a is a good good use of funds um, and and asking for students as much as I hate to do it to um, you know be, be paying for some of the the increase in inflation um, to me doesn't seem unreasonable. Do I like it? No. It's one of those choices, right? And truly, the you know I make recommendations to the board. I'm not disowning responsibility, I'd make my recommendations, make my opinion known. If if the board <clears> would <throat> like to, you know, at least my philosophy is a bit too um, conservative, you know, that that's okay. Um, then please tell me. I mean, <laughs> can I say something like that? Sure. So, so it, would it be fair, the way I'm reading this and the way I understand it is that the reason that we have a relatively large reserve at this point is because we have had so much one-time funds. Yes. And as a result, it's actually backfilled what would have been potentially a very nasty situation financially, right? But, and but so, but can I finish? Yeah, I finish. Yeah. So, you know, I, I look at it and I say, yeah, there's a lot of prudence in having more. Um, is it 24%? I don't know. But I guess what I would say is, if we were going to spend any of that down, I would want to be really sure that it was one-time expenses, because I would not want to be spending money that was built up because we got really lucky with a bunch of um, relief funds available, which won't be coming again probably in a long time. Um, I wouldn't want to spend those one-time funds, essentially, that we built up. <clears throat> and it, it will, would be non-sustainable essentially because we could pay for it one year and then the next year we're um, in the red again, right? And then another thing to consider too is we're building this budget on the governor's recommended budget and then the Ways and Means came out with their recommended college budget, 10% less. And we don't know what the legislature is gonna give us. They're not gonna tell us till the end of May or first part of June. So there might be something we have to adjust anyway, just because we don't know what the support fund is going to be from the, from the state. So it's nice to have some wiggle room just to make up for things they do in there. Um, I, I actually think it's about two and a half percent. I don't know if it's 10%. Oh, the means? Yeah, I don't think it's that much lower, but it is Okay, lower. it is lower. Yeah, it is lower. <laughs> What, what will that equate to us? Um, it's hard to say because the, the formula. Is, um, I I don't see it as I see it as being pretty negligible. I'm not worried about it, Kathleen. I'm not chatting. I don't feel a lot of. At least I didn't, and you know me. I, I like 24 percent. So I, I respect everyone's concern. 24 percent. I've heard of and have seen in the other budgets I've been involved with. But prior to the five letter word that we've had to deal with for the last three or four years, if you look at our past previous positions at this point in time, we, our numbers, our percentages were in the 12 to 16 percent. And it was continuing to get closer to 10 over the last budget prior to that time. If, if this was our second or third year of 20 percent above, you know, 20 percent position. I, I would have a little more serious conversation, but if this is just an anomaly and we get through and find out where we are, you never know what's going to happen when it comes to the budget season. The um, sale the company, um, I'm fine with it at this point in time. As I could talk to anybody in front of, in front of the public on it. Um, like I say, if it was the second or third year we had this, I'd be really concerned about talking very seriously about what will we do with this money. And I do agree with Lori, Laura that. If it is a one-time spend. Well, I, I mean, kind of my response to COVID was we saw, we always, everybody talks about saving money for an emergency. And they, well, we saw it. And it was, it was million, tens of millions of dollars of emergency that without assistance from the government, again, the, we came out pretty unscathed. Um, so, you know, in my mind, I kind of saw the worst thing happen and saw what the consequences would be. 
but I, I absolutely hear your direction um, that this shouldn't be this high in coming years. One time dollars um, uh, should, it should be used for. And um, certainly we'll do that. We did not set out with a goal to end up this high. Again, Laura, perhaps I was the only one. Yes. Um, uh, <laughs> And and not and not because I don't understand there are needs, because I do. Just again, it's a sense of it's my sense of security, and I need other opinions to maybe bring that in. Debbie, yeah, in regard to the the tuition increase, I think you know, in with these past two years being so crazy with the COVID, I think it's better if you have. You know, a gradual tuition increase where if you let the tuition alone, then all of a sudden in another year, you could make ends meet, then you'd have to raise it 10% instead of 5%. So, you know, that's my opinion on the tuition increase. It seems reasonable to me. Yeah, I want to be, I want to be, probably one more, one more plug here. I, where I'm coming from is I'm actually fine with the tuition increase that we put. I, I still think we're very, very competitive compared to our peers across the state. To me, I think there's sufficient buffer in there to put more into deferred maintenance. And let's take care of that now. But I mean, I'm totally aligned with where Laura's coming. This is a one-time thing. I would argue you, you do the investment now so you don't need to do it next year or the following year or whatever. And again, I don't know what that number is. That's that's just that's where I'm coming from, Phil. Yes. Yeah. And that is something that we could decide to do even after the budget's approved. So if we have, you know, we kind of you know looked at what is a manageable, manageable amount of repair and construction or maintenance that we can do, um, and what can one year's budget support. Um, if that number, you know, the, the list of projects is 2.4 million. We have outstanding projects above the 7 million, which we probably do. We do. Make it doing that in the current year, um, we would still have a mechanism in the budget. You would have to seek appropriation um, via resolution to do that additional spend and that invest in additional investment. Wow. Well, I think. In, in healthcare, we also received uh, emergency funds during this time, but looking at the operations, I feel I'm kind of with you, Lori. Like it, it's, it feels a little bit nicer to have more of a cushion to see where things are going. Um, but maybe that, that's just from my perspective, watching you know this recovery where things are at. And um, even though the health emergency is over, there's still a lot that's kind of in flux. Yeah, but you don't need to be differential. <laughs> Your opinion is totally yeah, that's, valid. That is, that's just where I'm at. I, like, yeah. it's, a, it, it's a different comfort level and possibly to get to that comfort level in the decisions they need is stay with 24% or decide what you'll do and move it down to a percent percentage. Is to, I would propose to leave it as it is as we're able to uh, get our feet on, on this and have you know our staff come back and say, here's what we do. If we sign us going to 16%, if that's $3 million, come back and say to the board as well, we would report to the budget folks because there's some concerns over there as well. Okay, here's what we here's what we've done, and this is where we put that money. We have put it to a one-time expense, and it's going to happen this year, it might be 24, 25. But it's just a matter of is it, where's the comfort level in regards to what we do with it going forward. Uh, I think it behoove us to keep what we got right, what's being reported to us and look at it in the next grant or decision. One last comment. Um, I've, as I've been on the board for a while, but what I've heard in the past is that sometimes either tech or legislative fiscal will look at our, our fund. And if we have a lot of reserves, although you've had enough money, you don't need more. So there is a balance that we got to kind of have with reserves versus um, not having reserves. So I think it's a good conversation we're having and that we should keep having. Um, I just want to add in, some of you have been in this way longer than I have. 
Maybe Alicia, you think it's, it did happen at some point in the past. How many years ago? 20? Yeah. yeah ish, and that we we all a number you can know, kind of money back. Um that that hasn't ever been threatened in my time here, and it's not that long, or at least in recent memory. And um I just I, I've tried to try to talk to people around the state and community college world and say, how much do you worry about that? Um, and because it just it, that just seems that, that would be just so perverse for the state to do. Um, I know you're going, yeah, I guess we won't worry. But um, <laughs> um, you know, wow, punish good behavior. Um, yeah. Can I? Is it one more thing sure. to follow on what Lori said? What we have seen in the time that I've been on the board um, is the legislature come back and clawed back some of what they had promised us in a, in a year. In other words, we've seen um, when the, the budget has gotten bad at the state, where the state has come back and said, we promised the community colleges X dollars, and now in the middle of the second year, we're going to reduce that by 15% leaving the colleges because then you now have to make up a two-year shortfall in six months. So it's really a 30% we're taking away in the second. <clears throat> so I've seen I've seen the reverse where I mean there's there's solid reason to have a good reserve. I don't know if 24% is the right number, but <clears throat> but there's solid reason. I also and this is just just kind of explains why I'm I approach this thing I do and corrupt. You know, I go, hey, um, at my last institution, the state of Michigan, we had significant reserves than this. And we didn't, I mean, for whatever reason, we didn't worry about the state coming and taking them. And um, and that allowed us so much ability to not go out for bonds, to build new things, you know, to not have to do a capital campaign. And it, so, um, Again, it's just not what I'm used to. So this is a bit of a different environment, even you know, even after four years. Do you know where our peers are as far as what their typical reserves are? Be interesting to know. It's it's I I I feel very confident in saying that it is not this. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I feel very confident okay. saying there are board policies that are not followed about amounts of reserves. <clears throat> Okay, Captain Rich Adams, uh, you want to proceed with the motion? Are we ready for that? Uh, so, so the resolution is provided. It wouldn't be me then. Okay. Uh, all in the motion to approve the budget resolution. Be it resolved that the budget committee of Central Oregon Community College is hereby approved the COCC district. Proposed budget expenditure for fiscal year 23-24 in the aggregate amount of 118,463,057 total of all funds and the permanent tax rate of 0 0.6204 per thousand of assessed value be levied against all assessed property in support of the general fund. It's further resolved that a tax of 3,092,424 be approved for the debt service fund for the purpose of satisfying the required debt service of voter approved general obligation of bonds issued by the district. Second. Okay. The resolution. One table. Aye. 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 Great, great discussion. Let's all warm up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Uh, Dave, when Dave Jonah left, everybody was very worried because he had this sort of larger in life earned and earned larger than life reputation about his mastery of accounting in the budget. And, um, and Kathleen, you stepped in, um, uh, did a great job, um, and and brought some new twists to this and gave us new ways of thinking that I think that we appreciate above. And so many thanks to you. Um, I feel very grateful for you. Thank you. It's been yeah. an honor to sit at this table and present, you know, be in charge of presenting the budget. Um, 
But yeah, I also look forward to passing it. Stepping away from the table. Mr. Roger, I take it you're we're adjourning from the budget committee. You're turning back. You're the chair. You can just take a motion. Second. Favor say aye. All right. Great. Thank you. So we're back in the full session. Um, members of the budget committee, you guys are certainly welcome to stay if you want, and you're also welcome to leave. Uh, thank you again for your, your service. And I think as Dr. Chesley said earlier, um, particularly with our new VP for uh, finance, uh, you'll get a chance to certainly be more informed. Um, although I thought you actually did quite well. Yeah. <laughs> great great yeah. questions, great discussion. Thank you. And we yeah. certainly appreciate your service. Thank you. Our next item is the consent agenda. I would entertain a motion to approve that. So moved. Second, moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand or signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. That passes. Uh, information items. Uh, the Bruce, do we have to go back to the audit report under six just above the consent agenda? Mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't see you. I don't see you. Okay. Uh, next item is the information items, financial statements. Are there any questions for Kathleen? Okay. Moving on to the new hire reports. Any questions for Laura? This is as quick as the consent agenda, right? Thanks for seeing the hire on a CCC grad into the accounting position. Yeah, that's, that's fine. There you go. Somebody else did that. Somebody else did that. I can't take credit. Oh, yeah. She didn't work here for a while. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, congratulations to her. Next item is the Title III grant. Let me show. It's just one minute here to get loaded. All right, um, Laura or Jim or Oliver, give us a wave if you can here. We've been, I've been told in the past, I project really well. But in other words, I'm loud. Um, super excited to share with you about our next Title III grant application uh, for the federal and U.S. Department of Education called the Strengthening Institutions Program Grant. Right, and it's all about the infrastructure needed to support the institution and in helping our students uh, be successful. So just some basics about the grant, um, walking out a quick walk through memory lane. From 2016 through 2021, we had another uh, Title three grant. And if you remember some of the things that we focused on were things like placement redesign, developmental education redesign, first year experience, how students get started with us. And we implemented a lot of software tools that really help us um, ensure that students have all the resources they need to be successful. And that, like this next grant, um, was a five-year grant, uh, and it did require us to sit out a year, year and a half between grant cycles, so we couldn't immediately apply for that grant. But the next grant cycle came open um, about four weeks ago, and we've got some pretty amazing teams across the college uh, scrambling, as we speak. I think I emailed like 72 people today for information. Um, but to really pull together our next grant, and so I want to walk you through some of that. Oh, I did like to show this number at the bottom of the screen. Um, the grant itself is, that we applied for last time was $2.3 million. And you can see we came pretty darn close in spending nearly every single penny um, of that grant. So some really fantastic work supporting our students. But the grant itself has some basic um, requirements to it. It is called strengthening institutions. So none of the money can go directly to support students. Right? We get people who say, can we give scholarships? Can we buy these supplies, these tools? Whatever the case may be, but the money is intended to strengthen internal structures to help directly support students. So not direct aid to students. It is a five-year grant. Um, and we found out in 
March, late March, about uh, the grant availability. Um, and it's this year, again, it does focus on institutions that have a high percent of Pell eligible students. And so Pell grants are those grants that are available to low income students. And this year, we had about 39 to 40% of our students were Pell eligible. Big change in 2015 when we applied, and that number was upwards of 55%. So we have seen a big shift in low-income students coming to community colleges nationally during the pandemic and post-pandemic, and that helps really for POCP. Uh, but it still is considered a large number of health students. Again, it's 2.25 million um, total over the life of the grants, or about 450,000 annually. Institutions do have to have a plan to, have to sustain those efforts going forward for any ones that are not one-time efforts beyond the life of the grant. And so that's a big portion of our grant application. It does require that we hire a grant coordinator um, to help us manage the reporting, the data, all of uh, uh, regulatory aspects of it, and bring in an annual outside evaluator to show the department that we're making adequate progress towards our goals. Uh, application is due May 22nd, and we hope to be notified by mid-August. That's our best guess. They don't really tell us when that. Last time, um, we didn't, we were not notified in the first round, but by the time the department head goes back out to all the institutions to apply, see how much they really need, additional dollars tend to be freed up when we were getting the grant one year after our initial application. So um, even if we don't make it, I don't think it's going to be an issue, knock on wood, uh, we do have opportunities in the future. So what are we doing? This year, um, we have uh, four primary proposed activities. The first is guided pathways plan. Um, we've talked to you a little bit in the past about our state efforts around guided pathways. Amory and I are co chairing that work together um, and recently have had several workers come together to say, What is it that we want to do under guided pathways? There's so much out there, right? And so we I got proposals back from folks about the same week that uh, we got the grant application. And uh, we have a five year plan of activities that align with some of the grant requirements. So really working on that uh, giant list of projects it is part of our proposed activities. Um, developing a teaching and learning center. We've had a fantastic group of faculty volunteering their time to help their colleagues in gain professional development skills around teaching and learning. But now it's time to take it from that more ad hoc volunteer base and formalize it like a lot of institutions do to provide really structured uh, learning opportunities for our faculty, particularly around what the Department of Ed and this grant is calling open or accessible education opportunities, online, hybrid, and non traditional uh, learning opportunities. Student Resource Center. We've got some fantastic supports for students around what I call emergency or basic needs. Right, we've got our partnership with Thrive, a local nonprofit to help with housing and food insecurities. We have a food bank run by our student government. We've got a clothing connection run by a couple of our faculty and a couple of their state grants focused on basic needs. But they're in all different parts of the Bend campus. Some are at the branch campuses, some are not. They're coordinated by different areas. And it's time to bring those together under one leadership umbrella, right? And folks that work with these uh, areas are super excited about that. And it's not only one leadership umbrella, but one physical location. Um, on the Bend campus, and then increasing those access and those supports out on our uh, uh, Redmond Matters and Tribal campus. And the last piece, um, I do my best to explain this, is called a unified data analytics system. Chime in if you can help me on this, Erica. But um, what essentially this means, we have about seven or eight major databases that support everything from um, all of our student registration and uh, course assessment and our um, scholarship programs and our degree audit system and our degree planning tools, but they're all independent systems. And anytime we need a report at this college, our institutional efficiency staff has to go out and talk to each of those systems and manually extract data and manually put it together for so you We refer to this kind of as a data lake. That data lake has all these streams feeding into it. Let me get an analogy right. Oh, um, right. Has all these streams feeding into it. And then if we can have that all come together under one unified solution, it can be far easier to get data in the hand for both strategic and operational decision making than what we do now. Um, and far less new. So those are our four activities. <laughs> and one of the things the grant has is it's called competitive preference priorities. In other words, here's the basic things we want you to address, but if you can address these areas, you can get additional points towards your application. And these competitive preference priorities pretty miraculously line directly up 
with um, some of our work. So any student success program. That's that, really convenient. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I mean, we do like that about it. So we don't play the lottery game. But we do have our uh, one of the areas they look at our student success programs specifically for under what they're calling underserved um, students, students of color, low income students, students impacted by the pandemic. That's exactly what guided pathway is exactly what our student resource center is there. It talks about accessible learning opportunities. Which is with emphasis on online hybrid courses, exactly what the teaching, learner, the teaching learning center will focus on for the first couple of years of their operation. And then, um, very undepartment of Ed like me, uh, say that, um, is uh, investment in a high quality data collection and analysis system. And that is exactly what that data is supposed to be. So, we really did uh, get pretty darn lucky that these additional, it's only additional six points in a, out of the 100 possible for this grant, but they really do line up incredibly well and pull this together. Another metaphor that I've heard is data warehouse. Or data warehouse with all sorts of loading docs. I have so, I have so many questions. <laughs> do you, and so, how do oh. you decide on what platform that is? So yeah, so part of the what the grant requires on all of those activities is a five-year term by term plan for implementation. Okay. And so for the uh, data analytics system, for example, part of the first term will be identifying where's our gaps in data, where are our gaps in what our IT systems can support. Another, the next term is developing a request for proposals and selecting that then. So it goes on each each of these activities has a five-year plan term by term um, to get us. Excited to see it. Be great. Laura will be excited to show it to you. Open <laughs> that link. <laughs> Data. So that is a really quick overview of the grant. Uh, we truly are working fast and furious on it this week, last week. Uh, so many thanks to uh, back up to the folks leading this work. Um, again, Anne Marie and me with Guided Pathways, Anne Marie and Jessica Julio with the Teaching and Learning Center. Andrew Davis, our director of student life, Lindsay Bukaferni, assistant director for student activities. Um, and Angie uh, Cole, one of our early childhood education um, faculty on the Student Resource Center. And then Laura Bomi and our institutional faculty and staff on the data link. So lots of good thinking, lots of great work there. Um, and super excited to see where we end up with all of us. Any questions or comments on that five-minute version of a 50-page grant application? <laughs> Are you guys very excited? Any uh, any questions here or <laughs> online, Jim or Oliver? No, I don't have any questions. Great. Well, good luck with that. Obviously, let us know if you need anything from from the board in terms of support letter or stuff like that that you can draft. <laughs> well, we will come back with a budget appropriation if we can. Yeah. So, yeah. Alicia, do you think, or may I ask a question? It occurred to me. Do you think this could be as meaningful as the last one that we got? Because that was pretty significant. Yeah, I do. Um, when we look at some of the metrics we set for ourselves, especially around student progression and uh, accumulation of early credits and the emphasis on that early success, I think it has a to be huge. And our, you know, our first Title III grant really focused on from the point of admission to the first couple weeks of the term. This one is really more about the start of the term to the end of the first year. So it really is taking that foundation work we did and trying to carry that beyond. You know, that's kind of what it looks like. Yeah. So, very cool. We're excited. Great. Thank you. Next is the uh, RN DSN legislation. Anne Marie and Julie. It's just Julie. 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 I wanted to, even though this is still in legisl legislation, I wanted to come now and get this on your radar. Um, and we've got some people, I know Oliver is here that's been through nursing and others that maybe are looking into that bits of things. Um, but anyway, this is a need all across the country, right? Um, are not just nurses, but bachelor's prepared nurses. 
and there's a shortage everywhere. Um, so I thought the best way to kind of go through this is just answer questions. Right. So don't we already have nursing at CWC? What is an RN to BSN program? Why is RN to BSN and not just the BSN program? Why do we need it just in general? And then why community colleges to offer it? And then what our next steps are. And feel free as we go if you have questions, just ask away. So the answer is yes, we do already have nursing. We have an amazing nursing program that's accredited and approved by the Oregon State Board of Nursing. Um, but it is a um, two-year program. It's an associate degree. Yes, they still end up as an RN. They still can work as a registered nurse. And they take the same exam, the NCLEX, but they have a two-year degree. So what's happening all across the country is there was an Institutes of Medicine decree, if you will, that hospitals should have 80% of their nurses as bachelor's prepared, right? So when I say RN, we're meaning registered nurse, again, those could be associate or bachelor's prepared. When we say BSN, that's a bachelor's of science in nursing, where our students right now get what we call, they get an ADS degree in social arts, but we call it ADM, associate degree in nursing. Um, so we do have it, and we have we're a nursing assistant too, which is, it used to be a nine credit course, and now it's going to be a seven credit, just one course, and they can go to work as a nursing assistant. So it's the next level up, if you will, our individualism. So let's talk about what it is for a second. Um, it would be a two year program. So all the students, they've already got their RN, they're a nurse, they're a working nurse. But they have an associate degree. So they're going back to school. So this will be delivered likely in a hybrid format, so evenings, weekends, some online asynchronous, maybe some Zoom. However, it works. We're going to poll our current students. We've already been starting to do that to see what the community, what they want. And we're going to go to the same thing at St. Charles and poll them to see for the, the working nurses there. What would work best for them if we were to do this? Um, and the good, the, you know, this part here, the not requiring clinical hours, that's huge because that has been some, oh no, we shouldn't do that. We're already burdening our, you know, St. Charles, we're doing so much already, sending so many students there. But this one does not require clinical hours. Um, it's more things like leadership classes, management classes. It's going to allow them to move up in their, in their careers. And, it, and so uh, most of our, so our associate mm -hmm. nursing right now is 100-ish credits. Um, and this would be an additional 90, as you know, most bachelor's programs are about 180 um, credits. Hey, Julie, can I ask a question? And I, I, this is not my field. And so I don't know if the Abraham Lincoln quote is like, it's much better to have keep your mouth shut and people think you're stupid than open it and, and prove them that you are. <laughs> but I mean, if, if, you get a, if you get an RN after two years and another two years, you have a you have a BSN, mm -hmm. like, wow, that, I, I would have thought there would have been, it would have been closer. I mean, I would have thought, I mean, that, that sounds like a, a lot of additional time just to get a BSN. Well, do you, do you understand my question? I'm, not, I'm, I'm struck by that. If you, if you can actually get a, an RN after two years, I would have thought you would be a BSN plus if you put in another two years. Well, do consider when we say an associate degree is two years, that's two years once you're, it's a selective admission program. Once you're in the program, it takes them about a year to do the prerequisites. And then they do two years okay. in our program. And then, yeah, and then it's two more years because they've got to get to 90 credits. Just 45 credits or so in a year. Yeah. So for, for an RN, it's still three to four years. Four years in the whole scheme of things. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, so why this RN to BSN and not just a BSN program? BSN programs is what a lot of the universities have. So my daughter right now, oh my gosh, I wish she was here, but you know, kids who grew up in Bend, they want to fly the food for them and go to like cook up. She's at Gonzaga University up in Spokane, and she is in their nursing program. They admit the students straight out of high school right into nursing. It's a four-year program, BSN is bam, right, you know, right into it. Where we don't do that here, we do the two-year associate degree, and then they would apply. But here's the thing, it's not just our students that can apply to this RN to BSN program. 
it's changed from all over. You think of all the nurses that work not just at St. Charles, but all the healthcare clinics in Central Oregon, they all could take care, right? So it opens up doors for a lot of different folks. Um, and remember that St. Charles, they are specifically asking us for this program. Um, OSU uh, met some obstacles. They've been trying to get that. They've met some obstacles at the provost council level. Um, but we recently received um, an email from their new leadership about wanting to see if there are ways to partner in the future. So Lori and I will be meeting um, with um, I, 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 my, I won't speculate um, with the leadership at OSU Corvallis at Cascades and with leadership at Oregon Health Sciences University, um, which has um, largely been one of the barriers to more bachelor's trained nurses. So I, I think it's going to be fascinating. Well, yeah, that's what it's going to be fascinating. A little bit about the bill where that's at. So Senate Bill 523, um, it did initially pass the Senate unanimously, and that's the bill that does allow community colleges to offer this RM to BSN program. Um, it is now the House, uh, and there is a work meeting tomorrow at 3 o'clock, and there will be a vote taken after the work meeting. Uh, the reason for the work meeting is there was an amendment that was just recently made two days ago um, because there were some let there was some language that didn't make it into the bill that needed to be in there. Something about community colleges can only offer two year degrees with the exception of applied baccalaureates. This is not an applied baccalaureate. So they had to put an exception in there, except RNBSN, which means when it, I'm going to be optimistic here, when it passes the house. Right. It will need to go back to the Senate, and we know what's happening there right now. So there might be a little bit of a hold up, but <laughs> positive. <laughs> so any questions just about the, the bill in general? Well, I don't know where my question fits in this fire. Please, I'm trying to, I, I was in, I, I was in an interpretation this is the level of, of uh, education of the nurses. This is the number of nurses that we need. Um, so we, you know, we need more nurses, but we need more nurses with the BSN or the yeah, BSN we need to get into, into the system. Yeah, so we've got nursing assistants, there's nursing assistant one, nursing assistant two. There's a thing called a licensed practical nurse, which St. Charles doesn't use a lot of. Um, and then there's an RN, and then those RNs are divided associate and bachelor. Because our program is a primary feeder, right, for nurses at St. Charles, most of those nurses are associate prepared. Now, there's data that shows there's less mistakes. There's a higher level of comprehension, all these kinds of things if the student gets a bachelor's degree. So again, with this inter Institute of Medicine kind of mandate that they want 80% of the nurses to have a bachelor's, St. Charles is hurting a little bit because most of theirs are from us and their associates. Okay. So now students, if they need to go on, they are primarily going to Linfield online, Grand Canyon online, or Western Governors University online. But what we're the reason we want to do this and kind of jumping ahead to the wide community colleges, students here, they know us. They've been in our program, they trust us, right? And they can stay here and it would be cheaper. There's, it's likely that we would be part of a consortium of seven to nine community colleges um, in Oregon that would go forward and do a, a statewide curriculum. So whether you went here or Chemeketa or, or wherever, do the same program, same cost. So I'm jumping to hell, we'll do that in a second. But, um, any questions on just the why the RMB is Yeah. Yeah, just and really quick, but I'm always curious um, where my mind goes. And people would say, well, where why does your mind go there, Bruce? But in the kind of I look at the ch child care and so the, the hydraulics between, you know, we we want high quality child care, but then you need to pay for providers and it, it sort of it, it gets complicated. 
So if I have an RN and I go back and get a BSN, do I get a bump up in my salary? No. Or is it this more yes. like this is kind of a mandate? I got to get into that 80% threshold. Okay. Yes. Yeah. okay. My, my, I, I can just tell you, my niece who graduated from our nursing program last year is getting her um, BSN now okay. from Linfield. And, and she's been told, St. Charles is actually paying for it, and she's been told what yeah. the raise Great. will yeah. be when yeah, she gets right that. Yeah. Um, yeah, more opportunities for promotion and higher pay. So if you want to be like a, a manager, and Oliver could speak to this too, but he's going to be a floor manager, those kinds of things, those are going to be the BSNs that are going to be rising to those positions. Well, when they talk about nursing excellence, is like the, the RN, you're learning to be a nurse, and the BSN, you're it's a lot of critical thinking, like additional critical thinking in the nursing field and knowledge. Mm -hmm. So you're gaining more expertise. Yeah. It's not skill based, yeah, it's more theoretical. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about the applied BSN versus BSN issue? Yeah, so the applied baccalaureate that is approved in the state of Oregon, that doesn't work for nurses. So I think there's Washington State had the same age that they had to deal with the different state. But what happens is we, to, to go on and get a master's degree in nursing, you have to have a bachelor's of science in They will not accept an applied baccalaureate. And most hospitals don't want to hire somebody with an applied baccalaureate. So it has to be hiring and moving on. And the master's is really critical because our main pipeline issue of getting enough nurses in the workforce is we don't have, we don't have enough instructors to train them. And so we can't hire them. We struggle. We're trying to hire two full-time nursing people. We hired one. Thank goodness. And she's amazing. But we already had a failed search in the second one. We've reopened it up, trying to get more applicants. And it is really tough. And they have to have masters. So that's the reason that this couldn't fall under that applied baccalaureate field that went through and all that. Yeah. All right. Well, let me finish up here. Um, so, so why do we need it? We know we have a severe nursing shortage in. There's actually something called a, a, a maldistribution. So there's a shortage everywhere, but it's really severe in the rural areas. And we are considered rural, whether we think we are or not. Um, and so that's an issue. Um, and they say Charles, oh my goodness, I mean, they don't have the nurses, so they're paying these travelers between $125 and $150. They're not, the nurse is not receiving that, but part of it goes to the agency. But $125 now, that is a lot more than they would normally have to pay. Um, so, you know, obviously you want to get folks in there for them. Um, and then let's see, we talked about lower costs, more options, more equitable outcomes, underserved populations that community colleges address. And then we talked about that last one, right? The masters. So, so why community colleges? Again, it's like we've got a proven track record, and our graduates are just as successful in the mid class. They rock it. Um, they do really well. So usually around the 90th percent, 90 percent of our students pass it the first time and then 100 percent of the second time. Um, so we talk about the graduates trust us and they know us. So next steps. Well, the bill got to pass. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first thing. Then the second thing will be coming to you because um, and Betsy came last year to kind of Used to skid a little bit and talk about applied baccalaureates, but this one will be different. So we'll be asking you to specifically approve the ability of COCC to offer an RN to BSN, to offer a bachelor's program, right? Um, even though the state says we can do it, hopefully, without this, <laughs> you all have to approve it at each individual. Um, and then this got cut off by all over there. Just kidding. But um, it's a differential tuition. So that's something we will be coming to you with too, um, because this consortium of community colleges, the seven to nine schools, which keeps growing, might even be larger soon. We want to charge the same thing across the state if, we, if all the different boards will agree to it. Um, that way they can move within the systems and all be the same. We're not competing against each other as much that way. And, and there's this is additional cost to the college. Um, and this will be higher if you approve it than our typical tuition, but it will not be nearly what university tuition is. There is right now no extra funding from the state to be able to do this. So um, 
that will be something new. So the differential is compared to what it is currently. It's going to be the same as the other community colleges. Okay. I didn't know so, the differential. Yeah. As there. So maybe like our 118 for industrial engineer, you know, the request might be something closer to 200. Because it is a bachelor's program they're getting as opposed to. Um, but we'll have to see. It might. Pardon? We'll, we'll get to the side. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let me finish up here. So NWCCU, of course, accreditation, our, our schools accreditation, they will have to be notified and approved that we do this. Um, ASIN is um, the accrediting commission for the education of nurses, and that is our independent national accreditation. They will have to be approved. Um, PEC, we'll have to like form this consortium we talked about these seven to nine schools. And it will we'll send off a statewide degree to be approved. Um, so whether they take it in, it'll be the same curriculum. Um, each of the schools of the seven currently have already designated a faculty member that will um, work this summer on the curriculum. So Kristen Lambert from our excellent nursing department is gonna be part of that. So a question for you on how yeah. this consortium would work. Mm -hmm. So if you're accepted, say, at COCC, mm -hmm. but you could transfer them to one of these other schools if they have room, is that the deal? Or what? What You, you could, but I mean, we will each be doing our own FTE. We'll be each granting our own degree. So the degree will come from COCC? Yes. I, Paul and I were just noodling the, I was just concerned about whether there be any antitrust issues associated with um, basically, the nine schools agreeing we're all going to charge the same tuition. You can have the lawyers in the room. I mean, I mean, if it's if this is some sort of you know the fact that it's a consortium and not as just we all decided we want you know we're coordinating a whole bunch of other stuff. It's probably much less of a concern. But anyway, just well, you all can tell us about that. That was just think, just something initial. Yeah, yeah. Keep. Me um, okay, so, um, he'll, he'll be happier if I just leave. <laughs> obviously, we'd have to hire people once it all gets going, and then the goal would be I know it's a hefty lift and a lofty goal, but the goal would be to open it on fall of 25. Any questions? Can we have to ask them all? Or... So, we're basically looking four years before, before we get wow, that is a long. So remember, we're putting out 56 nurses every year on it. So what will, what, will, what will that number be over the level of normal? We'll have to discuss what the cohort size will be, um, but I would imagine it would be anywhere between 20 and 50. I'm not sure yet. We haven't really talked about it. Could you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. My first thought is we're building a camp with all these people. But oh, why can't we get all this done in six months currently? Apparently, well, yeah, to me, I would think that the, well, yeah, the, well uh, we want to try to do it as fast as we can. And initially, um, we were talking about fall of 24, but it's just all the different approvals. Like, currently, if the bill does have ASIN accreditation and we go forward as a group, not all the schools already have ASIN accreditation. We do, but some of the member schools don't. Well, let's work with the ones that do. Yeah. And there's only four of us NWC and ATC and our ATC and all those folks. Well, just get to see one six months. We will do this fast. I can, I can <laughs> say this. Some of that is ability on our part to create curriculum. The major delays here are not COCC. Well, I understand that. Right. That's the reason I didn't bring up COCC. The letter asked me that they're not allowed to say yes in six months. I well, they could, but they don't. <laughs> I mean, they just don't. <laughs> I mean, this is kind of some model happening in other states, right? This happened in Washington and it took them about three years. But but they gave us now the template. I mean, I, I we're just we're, Joe and I are just venting. You no, know, and, and, I, I, and it's fair, but I gotta tell you, you know, I, I used to be on the CFCC advisory um, or the OSU Cascades advisory board, right? And when we would look at a new offering that was proposed, it would be seven or eight years until it came to be. This actually looks really reasonable to me. I mean, it's bureaucracy, but I don't know that there's a whole lot you can do about it to accelerate it. Because just like what you guys said, it's out of your control. We have to have time to, to market and promote it and um, get students 
knowing about. I mean, there's just a lot of steps, but yeah, I'm with you. If you, you want to do it as fast as you can, and as many things that can happen at once, you'll have. I'm not, I'm not gonna lose any sleep over it right here no more. <laughs> Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Zach, what you yeah. want to tell us about the meal of the year? That's good news. Hamilton, Lebanon, and then I sit out there and thought, oh god. So thank you everyone. I just want to give a very quick recap. Oh, I'm closer to the microphone. So that all those signs open my feet can hear me. Um, just a quick update on meal of the year. Thanks to all of you who were there. I think Laura and Bruce and Erica were there representing the board. Very much appreciate that. With a three year hiatus, this is our game on the foundation puts on for COCC. Um, we had 330 attendees. We had a gross revenue of over $390,000, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, they, we had 55 new donors. We gave two hundred fifty dollars or more, which is really exciting, frankly, because we don't do a lot of uh, list buying or acquisition. We try to bring folks into the foundation and the college support through our events, through our continuing education, through channel lecture series. So having fifty five folks step up um, and give us that level that's never given before is fantastic in the fundraising world. Um, and we're just really excited that we're able to get back and celebrate in person. We did some new things this year, as those of you who were there saw, center stage. A whiskey lounge, just some different elements because after three years, we thought, why not change a few things up? Um, and all were very successful. So, the feedback we got from a lot of our uh, the guests and attendees, several of you here in the room, is very positive. So, um, please mark your calendars for April 13th, 2024. It will not be Easter Eve, um, and we will do it again. And then we're, we're going to the second Saturday in April for a while. And, and so, that is something we can. Uh, we work actually with our nonprofit partners to make sure we don't double up on dates with other events in town. Um, so we've kind of secured that now after being in February for 40 years. We also honored the Ben Foundation. I want to make sure folks knew that Ben Foundation has been supporting scholarships for decades, um, 41 years of support um, for the Ben Foundation. So they were our honoree. We do a mockery every year. So it's like excited to have them um, be honored. And then finally, Jeff Bowen, who's an amazing scholarship recipient and a scholarship ambassador for the foundation told his story via video and then got up on stage and was able to be there that night with his significant other and I'm just really pleased to shine a light on him. He's an amazing young person. So happy to take any questions or just uh, bask in the glow and see you next year. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go back to what was it? What was the difference? Did you have something different about the whiskey bar? We <laughs> had one. <laughs> oh, you know, that one <laughs> <laughs> correct. Oh, we not we didn't do a silent auction this year, which is Silent auctions are sort of going away in this for two reasons. One is they are a ton of work. And second, they put a lot of, um, they lean on the community pretty heavily um, for cure to ask for items to be donated. Um, we did ask for some items to be donated for our wheel, a spin a wheel to win prizes, but we were able to do that with um, a lot of our trusted partners with swag from the CSC bookstore, with some other things, bottles of wine that people were donated, et cetera. So we we wanted to have some other fun things in there and we're going to the spirit distillers donated some. Product that helped set up and create a kind of a fun experience. So that was a, a, a fun element. Zach, remind me again how the food worked as far as what did the Culinary Institute provide? And then we went outside with. Yeah, back in 2018, just based on sort of the rhythm of, of the Culinary Institute schedule, okay. um, it was just a real burden and some enrollment numbers at that time. But okay, I don't prepare think I... the full meal. So remember, we don't have food prep facilities in Bazaar. The food is made at the Cascade Culinary Institute and actually trucked up with hot boxes and then played it out in the lobby. Hopefully, you don't see that unless you're going to the restroom. Um, so, we did that for years at PCI. I mean, it was meal of the year to feature our Culinary Institute, but it was just a real burden on those students. So, what we, we don't want them to not shine. Yeah. So, what we changed in 2017 18 was having the culinary students be our servers, be our ambassadors, prepare the dessert course. Have a great presence at the event and find outside support for the actual offering. Um, and that partnership started with Pronghorn, and this, the executive chef at Pronghorn um, is actually now at Band and Boone. So some folks are saying, well, how did Band and Boone come to do the meal of the year offering? He moved on, he loved the event, he loved the mission. So he took it to the GM at Band and then got approval to do that. And so four folks from Band and came up from their executive team. They were here for three, four days prepping for using the students in the prep. A uh, portion of the meal and then preparing the meal down at the Culinary Institute on Saturday. And 
trucking it up. And the reason that pork was so tender, if you had the pork, was because it actually sat for a little while, um, which is what they wanted. To. He chose the menu knowing from the moment they make it to the moment it ends up on your plate might be um, a little bit of time. That, that, that dessert was one of the best desserts I've ever had that was in my life. Well, we have, I think the best <laughs> baking in three street yes. okay. and program in the nation. <laughs> I'm a bit biased. You may have seen the baking pastry kiosk. So Chef Laura and her team did a fantastic job. And um, yeah, so the, again, we want the students to shine with the culinary institute to shine. And so if the last thing you remember is the delicious um, tort, that's probably a good time too. I was like, I, it's so rich. I can only have it's like, no, I, yeah, I'll, I got you going. <laughs> but you, 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 didn't, you didn't need to be that we'll big. We'll make sure to invite this to make it next year. Yes. To really round out your Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, Any other questions or comments for Zach? Great. Thank you again. Great job to you and all your all your team there. Thank you. Yes, yeah. yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the Madras irrigation rights. Jeremy. Sit next year with Paul. So if I get any of this wrong, he can kick me under the table. <laughs> I already see the Jordan glasses. So I need you. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to come and speak again. We are moving, continuing to move forward with the Madras expansion project. Um, as we're moving forward at a, at a really good pace, everything continues to be on track for a winter 2025 open. Um, I was pretty excited to be able to share that part of the land agreement that we have with the Bean Foundation that's been in place for a number of years, a couple of decades now actually, um, stipulates um, irrigation rights. There are irrigation rights that sit on parcels two and three of the land that the Bean Foundation is going to be giving to the college. And part within the agreement, it talks about um, the Bean Foundation can sell those rights in, at any point up until they up until they convey the land. Um, at which point, the college would have first option to purchase those irrigation rights, and the Bean Foundation receives a bona fide offer for those prior to conveying. The other option that exists is if the Bean Foundation continues to hold the rights when they convey the land, that the college would receive those rights with part of the and fee. The question that the Bean Foundation will pose to the college at this point in time is now that we are getting ready to actually begin the process of turning that land deed over to the college, is the college interested in taking those irrigation rights off? Do we want the water rights with parcels to be In discussion with the real estate committee, um, our recommendation, as you'll see in the resolution, is that we do not want the irrigation rights with parcels to be for, for several reasons. There's infrastructure costs that are going to come with keeping those water rights on the property um, that would make them essentially usable for the college. Irrigation rights don't necessarily fit with the college's landscape, current landscape method, which is natural scape or low, low scape man, uh, landscape. And it's going to require personnel to be on site, additional personnel being on site at the property when and introduce those water rights. The other factor that comes with those water rights is the water has to be delivered and used on the property at least once every four to five years, according to NUID. And so we are right now in year four of that five year time frame. So we would have to use the water next year on the land. Uh, all of that to say, there, there are a number of mitigating factors that have gone into this recommendation that we have, but we don't have plans to use the water for academic purposes, which is what the Bean Foundation had essentially offered them to the college for when they said, we're gonna convey the land parcels two and three. If you have need for them for educational purposes, we'll, we'll let them go with the land. We don't have plans to use them for those reasons or for those uses, particularly because the water season is May to beginning of September, middle of September. And those are, that that time is, is not really um, usable for the academic program. Like we don't have an act program at COCC. Um, there's no conversation currently about putting an act program in place um, in the next several years. And so at this point in time, we just don't have any use for the water rights, nor do they align well with our campus services approach to landscape. And so our recommendation is that we would inform the Bean Foundation that um, essentially we have no interest in obtaining the water rights and this would give them time between now and about August is when they're going to convey the land um, to 
work with NUID, which is the irrigation district there in Jefferson County, and pass those water rights on to um, other constituents within the water district to make use of those water rights. So it's like they're called water rights, but as far as we're concerned, they're water responsibilities. <laughs> <laughs> they hold a lot of responsibility and and a lot of costs then come with this associated with the so Jeremy, we, we had talked one time about um, expanding the opportunity in the Jefferson County to, I don't know, to, to upskill farmers on how they can do a better job of farming. And we can still do any of those types of things without having to do water on the land right there. That's correct. Any academic program that would be developed that would um, be in that, that farming sector would use much less water. You can do very small plots. You can do very small sample sizes, and we wouldn't need 20 acres of water rights to do to accomplish the educational outcomes that we would be seeing. And they would be those courses would run September uh, and fall, winter, spring, maybe some summer courses. But again, they don't. They don't really. The water rights don't align with our academic year. Yeah, I can imagine a farmer isn't going to want to take a class in the middle of the summer. That's the time they're going to be. Yeah, right. <laughs> and and as we all know, obviously, you know, drought is a real concern across the COCC district, particularly in Jefferson County. And so th there's sort of a goodwill here, opportunity on, on behalf of the college to say we don't we don't have need for these. We don't foresee a need for these. We would rather see the water used for its intended purposes and keep it in the hands of the farmers that are growing food for all of us here in Central Oregon. And really in Madras, for those of you that don't know, 94% um, of, the, of the carrot seed that, that um, produces the small carrots that you purchase in the grocery store for the entire world is grown in Jefferson. So water is a big deal, not only for feeding our region, but for, for food across the, the world. And, and it could be used in stream. Right, or they, yeah, any anything from, used from, could be released back into stream or our, our landscaping. I mean, I know that um, it can be a lot cheaper than domestic water or than like utility water from for landscaping, but our landscaping is pretty um, pretty water friendly, isn't it? I mean, it doesn't you? Yeah, we're, as I recall, I, that tells you it's been a little while with COVID since I've been to the Madras campus, but we don't have a ton of landscaping. Low scape, water. low scape, no scape is yeah. the goal. Yeah. Great. Natural skating. Any questions, uh, Oliver or Jim? Any other questions here? So I would move that uh, be it resolved that the board of directors hereby authorize President Chesley or her designee to inform the Beans Foundation and COCC facility to relinquish the refusal clause in the land agreement between the parties. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Laura. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand or signify by saying aye. 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 Great. Thank you very nice much. Thank you so much. Yes. I would just um, like to um, thank the Bean Foundation for the oh, offer. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Option sure. data. So it's always nice to have, have options. It is nice. And, they, and they've held them for many years at our request, not knowing what the potential use of this property is going to be. And so um, they have held on to them to this exact point in time. Yeah, the Dean Foundation, uh, George and Company, oversee that. Uh, very community oriented minded. And they got two more projects coming up that you're probably aware of. It's not even related to the school, but uh, it's pretty impressive what they can have there, of course. Um, I'm pretty sure they can turn the water over back into one unit as well. Yes, I know that they, they have already received some. Not bona fide offers, but they've received some interest from farmers direct um, in the water rights. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity for them to make good use of where that water is. Cool. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Next item is uh, Board of Directors Operations. I think I'm going to start with people who are online. Oliver, are you willing to share what you've been up to last month? Thanks, Bruce. I have nothing to report. Thank you. Jim? Nothing to report from me. Okay. How about uh, Laura? 
on um, May 3rd, I had a conference with um, Pete McCaffrey about the water line. On um, the 3rd, I also had a call with Dr. Chesley on the same subject. Um, also on 3rd of May, I watched the candidate forum for the candidates for the COCC um, board put on by the League of Oregon Voters. And then on the 8th, the 9th, and the 10th, I had conversations with the identified stakeholders for the evaluation of the president. Ellen? So um, I've had two Oregon Community College Association budget committee meetings and one executive committee meetings. We have, um, we don't have our executive director anymore. So we were having budget issues and leadership issues, but things seem to be moving forward in a positive way. And I think I did a college affairs meeting, but I can't remember if it was this month's last month. But they're doing great. And, uh, you know, I think they got some good stuff moving forward. Good. Thank you. Erica? Just the president's evaluation when I heard it. Super. Joe? Um, April, April 12th, and that was Terry Fidel. And also Susan Meyer and another party that I do not remember the name. They came in the address to speak with us. In regards to small business, small business development center that we have here on campus as well as our address and other locations, and talked about the CDIPD, which is the Center for Business, Industry, and Professional Development. Uh, we probably were supposed to meet for about a half hour, and it's basically about an hour and a half of the date. And uh, I certainly enjoyed uh, talking with them and getting more, uh, more information from them as much as they can pull from them. So it was a good meeting. Great. Thank you. Uh, April 14th, um, met with Dr. Chesley for a typical Friday uh, info session that uh, she has with Joe and myself on numerous occasions. On April 19th, I got to wield the, uh, the interim presidential. Power. Uh, I sat in for Dr. Chesley to welcome people to the TFCC's climate action teaching um, held in Willie Hall. It was a lot of a lot of fun, great turnout. Uh, Noel Copley and, and Owen Murphy had did a did a great job, and really CFCC was very well represented, not only among faculty, but very interested students as well. So that was fun. And then obviously spent a lot of time helping to compile uh, the presidential evaluation material. Let's move on to the president's report. Well, I'm turning it over to uh, the wonderful Sue Christensen <clears throat> to give a short update about the uh, Prime Hill campus. And um, uh, one of the things we're planning um, probably for early in the fall is um, an update on all of the branch campuses and some of the scheduling uh, strategies that uh, Anne Marie has been piloting. and and some other updates. So, um, so that soon is going to uh, whet our appetite. There you are. There you are. Whet our appetite. Some really good stuff that happened here. I, I really love it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being back in Pineville. I've missed you. We haven't had a board <laughs> meeting here for quite some time. Uh, and it's one of the highlights of the year for me, at least. So uh, welcome back to the Prineville campus. And I know some of you have been here in the last few years, um, but the board meeting especially is uh, something I really enjoy hosting here in Prineville. So I want to give you a quick update on kind of what we've been doing uh, and what to expect. And um, these are the topics we're gonna, I'm going to go through today quickly. Uh, I'm going to talk about our K-12 partnerships our community engagement opportunities, uh, the Pride of Oakford County students, which are my very favorite part of anything we do here um, at the college, uh, some new and upcoming resources, and some goals coming up. So as you may know, what um, I do here in the community has a lot to do with our K-12 system. And I think that it's extremely important for us to focus on our, our K-12 partners and our K-12 students to be able to expose them to college opportunities uh, as soon as possible. And so in the elementary schools, I do what we call um, college and career awareness. So that's basically what do you want to be when you grow up? 
and, and asking the kids what what is important to you. So we have a college and career day for our elementary school that, that I participate in, and I go and uh, talk to those students. A college awareness program for the fifth graders. So those fifth graders um, come here to this campus, and we talk about what would it mean to go to college and what types of things could you do if you go to college. And of course, we give them some swag that they can wear home so that they can definitely uh, represent CSUC. Uh, and then we do promotion ceremonies. So at the kindergarten level and the fifth grade level, uh, they do promotion ceremonies, promoting them to the next grade. And so I go to all of those promotion ceremonies and shake their hands as they walk across the stage. And they constantly, um, um, how do I want to say this? They, as they walk across that little stage, they, uh, they hold up their sign that says, when I grow up, I want to be firefighter or an entomologist or a professional skateboarder. And they're constantly coming to me with this one of their favorites. Uh, they're constantly coming to me later and say, that's the college lady, and I told her I want to be a professional skateboarder, or I told her I want to be this. Uh, and so I really enjoyed those days, most especially because it's so heartwarming to see those kids as they uh, progress from, from one to the next, from one grade to the next. Then at the middle school level, I call this creating the pathway. I would do several things with the middle school. Uh, it's not that far away, so our students can often walk to us sometimes bus, depending on uh, the activity. So we have a career fair, and that happens every year after middle school. This year, we were able to invite the students here, and we bus them here, or they bus themselves here in waves. So we saw all of those middle school students here uh, on, our, on our campus, and we were able to talk to them about two of our CTE programs. And this year, we showed the manufacturing program and some health careers programs. So they got to be here on this campus again. We sent them home some swag so they can have something to wear uh, that says COCC. So they all got to come here and experience the campus. The seventh and eighth grade AVID classes come to our campus, and we have a little bit more in depth conversation about college and what can you be doing now that's going to set you up for success as you um, as we move into the next grade. And you can see here the um, AVID on the uh, Yes. What does that stand for? Oh my gosh. It is an awful. It's it's silly. Advancing. It, it's the, the, uh, yeah. something. It, it, advanced it via. Yeah. Something. What, 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 Determ what? Determination. It's just yeah. silly. individual determination. It's oh, silly. Thank you. I'm making it up. Okay. No, so it basically what it means are those students who uh, historically have not had the support from their families in getting to college. So maybe mom and dad didn't go to college, maybe these are first gen students. And these students need maybe a little extra assistance in helping them understand how do I apply for school? How do I um, take those advanced classes? What should I be doing now to set me up for, for success within the next stage? So is this a program that's supported by? COCC or school district? School district. Okay. School district, yeah. And so those students, seventh and eighth grade out of classes, come here and we talk about you know, what can you be doing to get yourself to that next level. Uh, and this year we had the, the out of students, we exposed them to the um, unmanned aviation program. This uh, picture is taken right outside this room. Uh, on the lawn, and they are spelling out AVID, and they're taking that photo of the drone. Advancement via individual determination. Advancement via independent determination. Individual determination. Not being confused with advancement in my work. I just had to tell me I had you just no, I don't and, and I and I want to be I want, I want to be clear. It's a great program. It does great job. I just think it's a, it's 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 a well, dumb it's acronym. Unfortunate. <laughs> yes. It's great. Uh, and then we also do youth camps, so you can see some of these are images of youth camps, um, and we were able to do nine of those last year with a grant, so those youth camps were all free for our students. We have similar grants this year, so we'll be able to do some of those again this year. We're excited to welcome those students back to our campus to um, offer those youth programs again. In high school, which as you can imagine, I spent a lot of time over at the high school, we have quite a few programs. So I'm just gonna highlight a few of those. Freshman success, every freshman at Kirk County High School and our, and our other local school, uh, Kirk County High School being the largest, comes here during their freshman success uh, class, which is the first term of, of, the, of every year. 
and we talk about what they should be doing to set themselves up for success. Beyond High School Night is one of those programs that is for our juniors and seniors, but it's actually a little bit more geared toward the parents and what should the uh, parents of the student be doing to prepare themselves for what happens after high school. The College and Career Fair, I have a couple of pictures of that here. That happened last week, and every single high school student, which there um, are nearly a thousand of them, I believe, um, we uh, come to the conference and we see them in the course of about two and a half, three hours. And we talked to a lot of students. And this year we were able to bring in, um, I did some general college stuff, but we had uh, health careers, we had dental assistant, um, we have this one. We had um, fire science, it, oh, and um, uh, ECE education. So we were able to represent quite a few of our uh, CTE programs, which is one of my goals for that, is expose these students to a lot of our CTE programs. Uh, this picture up here with the Bobcat is at the, um, at the senior parade. So we were handing out water bottles with CSP at the parade to every one of those seniors before they went to, uh, to graduation. One of the ones that I'm most proud of is the partnership program, which um, is uh, unique to Kirk County. It's CSCP and Kirk County School District that partner together to offer our students classes, uh, college level classes on a college campus, not at their high school. And the school district pays for that, for those classes. The unique thing about this is they articulate those classes back to meet a high school requirement. And if they choose to, the student can complete a college degree at the same time they complete their high school diploma. So that, that partnership program continues to grow. And as we get more students into um, um, the online program, which we see a lot of those, those partnership students there, and also in our uh, Grizzly Mountain Homeland uh, uh, School, we're going to see even more uh, students going through that program. So that's a really unique one and one of um, a great program for us. That is awesome. Um, and I, my, my one here is, and I know Cindy and Amory are on this, is this replicable on our other branch campuses with I1NJ, with Redmond, because that's that's just great, 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 great. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. We're going to clap them. <laughs> uh, and it's okay, and that's much more because you guys don't want to stay here all night hearing what I do over, over the high school. It's just a, a lot. Uh, so community engagement, as you probably know, and as you've heard from me before, that's one of the main things that, that um, we focus on at our Triangle campus is engagement with the community. So I've divided this into two separate areas, uh, outreach and then facility partners. As you know, we bring a lot of community partners into our facility, and I listed a few of them here for you. Uh, uh, the, and on the outreach side, we do a lot of work with the Chamber, we do a lot of work with EDCO, our service organizations, I think I, I feel like I'm consistently uh, talking to Rotary and Kiwanis and those types of groups about all the fabulous things we're doing at COCC. I've already talked about the K-12 relationship that we have. I also do uh, programming at Heart of Oregon uh, to make sure that we don't miss those, that group of students. Uh, working with the city of Prineville and uh, the Education Foundation, the Kirk County Education Foundation, and uh, being able to look through and work with, with uh, opportunities to provide funding within our school district and also uh, to our college students. And for those of us who love data, I brought some for you, and not just fun pictures from the school district. Uh, so we we um, thought about our students. Where is our Kirk County student? Where are they taking classes? And how are they taking classes? So this graph shows you where our current Kirk County students are taking their classes. And you can see that the majority of those students are taking classes online. Uh, the second place being on our Ben campus. So in person on our Ben campus. And then we have um, our Pineville campus at 13%. So those are in-person classes on the Pineville campus. Uh, and we have some remote and we have some students taking uh, classes in person in Redmond. So this is where they are currently taking classes. The thing we want to know is where do they want to take classes? So we did a survey of all of our Prineville and Kirk County students that have attended over the past four, uh, four terms. 
And so we looked at that data to see where they want to take classes. And you'll see that the, the majority say they want classes in person and final. So the goal for us is to work toward making this a reality, making this happen. So 59% uh, want to take classes in person in Pineville, uh, the Pineville, the second place being online. But some of our students want online courses. What's the difference between streaming and online and remote? What a great question. Um, <laughs> streaming is um, a classroom full of students in Prineville, plus a classroom full of students in Madras and maybe another one in Redmond, and they're taking that class simultaneously um, with one instructor who's on one of those campuses. Remote is an instructor is somewhere, and students can be in their homes or anywhere else that they might want to be. And it's it's a synchronous offering. And online is purely asynchronous. Okay. You, you, you do that when you want to. Okay. Um, which part of it equates for people that still want to drive to Redmond or Redmond? Nobody wants to. It did not. So it didn't even, it didn't even show up on there. <laughs> it did not. It just, yeah, it wasn't on there. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so some new and upcoming resources. These are some things that we are, are really proud to be able to offer and offer now and in the near future. We got a very generous grant to uh, to put in to install EV charging stations here at the Pineville campus. So uh, soon um, we'll be able to offer that to our community and our students. Uh, and some of the, the programs that uh, Alicia alluded to earlier, the clothing connection is here in Prineville. So students can be able to put it, you can see in the, uh, in the comments. Students can go in and look at some clothes and, um, and find some new clothes to maybe look for a job or uh, maybe um, wear to, to class so they're not wearing something else. Um, and that is here. In Franklin, and, and the clothing connection will mail clothing to us also if there are special requests from students. We got a student refrigerator. So we've been able to offer a pantry of dried uh, foods for students for shelf stable foods, but we now have a refrigerator for fresh and frozen foods. So students can go in there and they can get salads and, and fruits and vegetables and things like that. That, was, that is a fairly new resource for us, and we were really happy to provide for our students. And we were also able to secure a, a donation from one of our local community members um, to provide some new science equipment, or not new, some science equipment for us. So we were working with the science department to be able to develop some programming uh, to utilize that science equipment so that we can offer more lab science classes to our, our criminal students. And lastly, goals. We need those. And you saw the data. So we, of course, have goals around that data. We want to create a three-term, comprehensive, intentional, student-centered academic schedule. And that is in the works now. But when you think back to those pie charts, they want classes here. So if we can create that three-term, comprehensive, intentional student-centered schedule, then that will meet uh, the need of what those students are telling us they want. We want to increase the number of students utilizing the partnership program. So that's one thing I'm working with the school district to see how we can do that. And we did a little bit of that intentionally this upcoming year with scheduling our classes differently to align with their schedules. That was going to be my question. I know that's been a problem. Our bell schedule hasn't aligned with theirs. It does now. It it some of it. We're making some uh we're making some changes that would allow for that. Yeah. Uh, and third, uh, building community awareness. I think this is something that I'm consistently working on, building community awareness for both our credit and our non-credit opportunities. So you're going to that first bullet. Mm -hmm. What are the barriers, challenges, or what, or, you know, in my, uh, I was an economics major, like, where's the market failure? Like, what, what, how come we're not there already? Is it lack of funding, lack of, um, you know, faculty capacity, things like that. What are the main barriers to getting that three-term comprehensive academic schedule? We need, fa we need uh, qualified faculty that will teach in kind of. Okay. So if you know anybody, please send them my way. And uh, that's a serious request. We need a uh, qualified faculty to teach on the kind of. That's the main barrier. 
we have students and it's up. Any other questions? I have one more question. Yeah. When you surveyed the students um, who had who had been here for, from Prineville, mm -hmm. those those are not students who were duly enrolled. Those aren't the partnership students. These are students who graduated from CCHS, and right. you're following where they went. That's correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about older ones? Older students? Yeah, coming back. Yeah. They're 35 years yeah. old, and they said they don't want to explain the newer anymore. Right? Are you asking me what I'm well, doing? Well, no, are those involved? Yes. That's true. Really yes, any student who has taken a class and has a zip code from Kirk County and they've taken a class within the last four terms. Mm -hmm. So that's that older student. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, looking ahead for dates, uh, Friday, May 19th is a Redmond anniversary celebration there, Redmond anniversary coffee at the Tech Center. Um, for those who are in Bend, I actually got a uh, got an email from a gentleman named Oscar Tobar, who's with the uh, Associated Students of CSCC. He's trying to organize a special city council meet and greet. Um, to have uh, students come and sort of learn about community leaders who's out there. Uh, he extended an invitation to me and other members of the board to come. And again, if people want to talk to city councilors or people on the board of CSC, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll send that out to you as well. It's going to be on Thursday, May 25th at lunch. So that's another thing that was not on your agenda. Um, a couple other things. Uh, our next board meeting, uh, June 14th. Uh, at uh, in Bend, and then Saturday, June seventeenth is commencement, and then July twelfth is the first uh, first meeting of the new board meeting of the new year. So. And I have one more um, that I'm about to put on the list. Uh, the salmon bake is this Saturday in Bend. Okay. Great. Eleven to four. Eleven to four. In Bend, it's not in Bend. In Bend. Okay. Great. Okay, at this point, um, the COCC Board of Directors will now meet in executive session for the purpose of ORS 192.660, Section 2, Subsection E, for the purpose of discussing real property transactions, as well as ORS 192.660, Section 2, Subsection D, Labor Negotiations, and ORS 192.600, Subsection 1, Subsection I, Performance Evaluation of the CEO. Representatives of the news media and designated staff shall be allowed to attend the executive session. All other members of the audience are asked to leave the room. Representatives of news media are specifically directed not to report on any of the deliberations during the executive session, except to state the general subject of the session as previously announced. At the end of the executive session, we will return to open session and welcome the audience back into the boardroom. Let's take just a couple of minutes, allow the room to, to clear, and then we'll start going to the executive session. Great, thank you. Thanks for sticking around, Rebecca.